Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Booth Western Art Museum. I'm Seth Hopkins, the director, for anybody I haven't met. Welcome, welcome. We're glad to have you. We do this the first Wednesday of every month, except for next month. We'll be doing it the second Wednesday of November, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, today we're going to do uh, something I try to do once a year and uh, just kind of report back on my travels. Uh, if you come to the museum and I happen not to be here, I'm not out playing golf usually. Uh, I wish I was, but uh, a lot of times I'm traveling around the West and, as we say, flying the flag for the Booth Museum. And uh, a lot of times even when I'm on vacation, I'm doing that too. I always say my vacations are like a lot of people's work, and my work is like some people's vacations. So we'll get a little insight into that today for you. And um, before we get to that, though, I want to welcome some very special guests. We have uh, at the back table back here and uh, spread out on a couple other tables are some uh, travel writers from around the southeast and around the country. And they're here uh, checking out our museum, and they're going to get ready to go tell people all about it. So please make them welcome. Uh, some of them have also been involved with us getting that recognition, um, best art museum in the country uh, through the USA Today 10 Best Readers program. And uh, so we thank them for helping us out with that as well. Um, Saturday night, uh, we have the uh, Circle Member opening for the Rhett Turner Photography Exhibition. So if you're a Circle Member, I hope you'll make plans to come out and register for that. If you're not a Circle Member but would be interested in getting involved with that group, we'd love to have you. Uh, talk to Leslie or Shanna. They'd be happy to help you out and get you involved with that. The member opening for that exhibition is going to be on Thursday night of the symposium. Uh, I believe that's the, it's the 19th. Somebody help me out. Yeah, Thursday night the 19th. We also will be opening our show of the Plain Air Painters of America, known as PAPA, the PAPA group. And so we have one painting by every active member of that group. We'll be opening that night along with the Rhett Turner Photography Exhibition, Conserving America's Wild Lands, based on his photography of his dad's two million acres that, as he said, I had unfettered access to. And uh, you know, how could I not get some great pictures with two million of the most pristine acres in America? But it really pays tribute to Ted's conservation efforts on those lands, uh, reintroducing uh, endangered species and really wanting the wildlife to thrive on those properties. Uh, that exhibition is already open, so if you want to see it today, you can go up and check it out. But please come back on Thursday night uh, and hear Rhett talk about it. Uh, we'll be doing a panel discussion that evening with members from the PAPA group, also with Rhett, and uh, we also will have a digital artist here, Marshall McLowry Monroe, who is the collaborator with Tom Gillian on our digital piece of art that's back there by the photography gallery. Has everybody seen that? If you haven't, go check it out. It's absolutely amazing. 29 digital paintings that Tom did using this Pixoils program that Marshall invented, and then they put it together and make a video presentation from it. But it's all digital end to end, so it's completely digital art. And uh, if Marshall's middle name sounds interesting, McLowry, uh, some of you will know who've attended some of Jim's lectures over the years. That's one of the protagonists at the uh, gunfight for the OK Corral. And we actually have a member who's also a uh, descendant from the Clanton family, which was also at the uh, gunfight at the OK Corral. And as both of those families say, they're misunderstood families, the McLowrys and the, Cl and the Clantons. So uh, he will be here to uh, talk about digital art. But uh, I think we're also going to get a few words about the misunderstood McLowry family. Um, going on that weekend is our art history symposium on that Friday. Uh, please come out for that. We're going to have some of the best speakers we've ever had, uh, folks from the Papa Group, uh, Rhett Turner, and also uh, Marshall will be talking about the, the new things going on with digital art and the amazing things they're doing with Tom Gillian's artwork in particular. So I think that's really going to be fun. And then, of course, all day Saturday is this symposium uh, and festival on the festival grounds. We'll have chuck wagon cooking going on. We've got one of our best cooks right here in the front and uh, demonstrations and the gunfights. And new this year, we're going to have uh, Mexican Chiria performers. These are the really elaborately dressed um, vaqueros and Chiria people. They'll be doing some rope tricks, uh, have their fancy outfits on. Really going to be exciting, something new this year for the festival and symposium. So please make yourself available to that. And of course, who's coming in to be at the Grand Theater? The Sons of the Pioneers with Roy Rogers, Jr. 
as one of the singers. That group's been around 80 years, and they still sound as good as they did back in the day. It's really incredible. Now, they've had 65 members that have been part of the group over the 80 years, but they're all really good. And uh, we have two shows, 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. at the Grand Theater. Get your tickets now. They are going quickly. And then uh, Art for Lunch next month, as I said, will not be on the first Wednesday of month. It'll be the second Wednesday of month, and that's November uh, 9th. We'll have uh, Alan and Patty Ekman here. Those are the paper artists, you know, they did that incredible paper art that's upstairs. And they will be here demonstrating how they do that. Um, there's also some classes going on that week uh, for students and adults to learn to use that method and how to make paper sculpture. And then we have an ornament making day as well. So be aware of that, get signed up for it. Um, I think it's $10, you can come and make your own Christmas ornament using their method and they'll show you how to do it. And I think they're guaranteeing they won't you won't mess it up. But I'm not committing to that. But I've heard that. OK, so without further ado, let's jump into uh, what we came for, shall we? So this is the most exciting travel slide I could find. <laughs> this actually uh, represents both the topics that we're going to talk about today, which my travels, but also new art into the museum. And this was a very exciting day. October 25th last year. This was when 42 Dave McGarry sculptures uh, showed up at the parking lot at our off-site storage facility. And we got to check those out for the first time. Uh, this is a collector in Canada who basically collected almost one of everything Dave did for the last seven, eight years of his career. And um, when he passed, he left it in possession of a friend of his who found us and said, uh, wouldn't you like to have this collection? And we said, boy, would we? And it's pretty complicated because the Canadian government and the American government are involved. And so a Canadian citizen can actually donate to a US charity and get a Canadian tax deduction, and vice versa. But it has to go through this board of uh, you know, civil servants and volunteers who uh, agree to take on this responsibility. And so they verify that it's a legitimate donation to a legitimate group. And then the work is actually loaned to us for the first two years, and then eventually we own it. So we're in custody of these right now. We're working on getting a few of them out on display here shortly, uh, probably be after the first of the year for sure. But uh, it's very exciting that we now own 42 Dave McGarry sculptures, or will very shortly. So that's an exciting, exciting thing with a very mundane picture. Um, the next week, um, October 28th through the 31st, I was in Scottsdale, Arizona for a one-man show by Martin Greeley. You see there kind of in the middle of the, the uh, picture. And they sold a uh, million and a half dollars worth of art in about 20 minutes. All Martin's work. And they're standing in front of one of his paintings there. And this was a very momentous occasion for Martin because this was the first time all of his siblings had all been at one of his art shows at the same time. Uh, his brother Marvin there on the left, uh, he's actually been here at the museum. He came when they had the CA50 event. But uh, most of the rest of them had been to various events, but never all at the same time. And so it was very exciting for Martin. And I was uh, glad to step in and be the photographer to capture that. Uh, we have a couple of members out there in Scottsdale, Ken and Deanna Zolstra, circle members, very supportive of the museum. And uh, when Martin's had this one-man show out there a couple of times, they've offered to host a brunch uh, for booth members and friends of the booth that were out there for uh, this event. And so this is on their back porch there in Scottsdale. And Martin and his family came and some other collectors came. And uh, Deanna and I did the cooking. And uh, this is my wife Joyce's uh, cheese grits recipe, which was a big hit, and a breakfast casserole that we served, and uh, a good time was had by all. Uh, moving up a couple more weeks, the uh, Cowboy Artist Show uh, is now in Fort Worth, Texas, and it looks like it's going to stick there and be there from now on, the first weekend in November. Our member trip for our circle members this year is actually going to that show. Uh, we'll go out a few days early and travel around and see some uh, private collections and uh, the great museums there in Fort Worth uh, prior to the Cowboy Artists Exhibition. Last year, a brand new hotel opened in Fort Worth called The Drover. And uh, this uh, is a, a neon light 
And so the rope actually has like three positions, you know, like those Christmas lights where they sequence and makes it look like action. So this whip kind of actually goes back and forth. And um, it's kind of, it sounds cheesy, but it is really cool looking. <laughs> it's right at the end of the little alley there when you go in the stockyards area in Fort Worth. And uh, that's my buddy Tim Newton in the front there taking a picture of it. Uh, this is one of the sculptures that's in the, uh, in the Drover Hotel. And they did a fabulous job theming it. I mean, it's all Western photography. It's all cowboy stuff. There's ropes and, and uh, chaps and stuff hanging everywhere. It is really cool. And uh, they gave us a heck of a deal to stay there. I think we paid under 200 bucks. I think their normal rate is like 400 plus. Because it is a really luxury hotel, really well done. If you go there and you want to splurge one night, I think you know it's worth doing for sure. Um, but somebody said, uh, you look like that sculpture. So I stood there, I don't know, five or 10 minutes. And I got a few tips, enough to pay the bar tab. And uh, so that was fun. Uh, so here's a, here's a crew. Uh, on the left there is Lauren Entz, who unfortunately we lost just a few weeks ago. Uh, he passed away uh, in June, I believe it was, or July. And um, so he's in here a couple of times, and just uh, a little bittersweet that he happens to be in here um, and that we just lost him. Uh, Phil Epp uh, to his right, and then uh, my friend Tim Newton and uh, the guy holding the camera. Um, so this is a brand new sculpture that's also right down in that stockyards area. That's Red Stegall, and uh, has become a good friend of mine, which is quite amazing to me that I've gotten to know somebody like him, um, and have gotten to travel with him and a group of folks that we go everywhere, uh, go somewhere every summer together. But Bruce Green just did this sculpture for the stockyards area, and uh, that's Red, and he's kind of pointing west, heading them up. But the real joke is, if you look real close, one of his fingers might be pointing towards Dallas <laughs> and might be indicating something. That's all I'm going to say. So, um, that's for your own interpretation. So uh, we we're going to go to Billy Bob's, which is right around the corner from here, and go honky-tonk and hang out. And uh, along the way, the artist's eyes started picking up on things and shadows and uh, structures and things. And we started taking a few pictures and looking at some things. We never made it to Billy Bob's. <laughs> you know, these artists, they see things that the rest of us don't see. And uh, Phil Epp was in my ear and said, take that picture, take that picture. And it came out to be a pretty cool picture. And then uh, Lauren was standing at the far end down there and took that picture kind of haunting in retrospect. Uh, and then we were walking down the sidewalk. Somebody said, look at that. Look at those shadows. Look how cool that is. I was like, yeah, that is pretty cool. So we stood there half an hour monkeying around making shadow puppets and <laughs> taking pictures. And, and uh, somebody said, do the CAA logo. fun to stay at the CAA. So this is what we were doing instead of getting the mischief at Billy Bob's choice. And then we wound up at the Shake Shack, which uh, that's about the weirdest place I ever would have thought they would put a Shake Shack. It was right in the middle of the stockyards, but it was enjoyed, I can tell you that. Um, some of you know my daughter Hadley, and uh, we're still not a month out here, but it gets lesser. Don't, don't worry. I know there's nothing worse than looking at somebody else's travel slides. But um, my daughter Hadley and I, um, since she was 16 years old, she's had a goal to be to all 50 states by the time she's 25. Uh, she will turn 26 next or 25 next month, and she's one shy. She hasn't gotten to Alaska yet. And I uh, had hoped to do that this year, but just it wasn't in the cards with everything else we had going. So hope to get that done the next year or two. But uh, this was a big trip that we took through the upper Midwest to knock out a bunch of the states that she hadn't got to yet last year. Uh, this is at the University of Wisconsin's football stadium, known as Camp Randall. And if you ever seen them on TV, this is the place where they do jump around. 
and the whole thing just gets rocking, and it's it's pretty incredible. And uh, so this is us uh, there at the stadium, and uh, this was a trip that we took. And if you know how big those states are, that's a pretty good chunk of real estate we covered. That was a four and a half day trip. So we flew into Chicago. Uh, we made this loop over into Michigan so we could have lunch in Michigan to check that off. Uh, changing planes doesn't count. Driving through doesn't count. You have to have a meal or you have to do something to count. So we drove to Lake City, Michigan and had lunch. On the way back, we went through South Bend, Indiana. Heard of that? Home of Notre Dame. We came back to Chicago, and then we actually uh, went and visited one of our circle members who lives in Chicago, the Meliors, Dr. Melior. They're the ones who donated the uh, wonderful Vic Payne canoe sculpture out on the grounds, and some of you may have met them when they were here for that last year. Uh, we then drove up to uh, Madison, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he saw us in that picture. Uh, on up to uh, Minneapolis, where another of our circle members, Cowboy Bob Miller, lives. We went and visited him. Then on up to Fargo, North Dakota. On down to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Not to be confused with Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. We stopped for a night and saw my aunt and uncle who live in Nebraska. Uh, we then went on down to uh, Southern Nebraska and went to Lauren Entz's studio, where he had just moved to from Billings, Montana. And we flew home from Kansas City. Like I say, nice, easy four and a half day drive. So uh, the day we were at Notre Dame was a fall Friday. The wind was blowing five miles an hour, just a little breeze, enough to knock the, the leaves off the trees, and they were falling, and the students were coming and going, and everybody was excited about the football game that weekend, which was an away game, which, which was great because we didn't have to get into all that mess. But, you know, people were excited, and it was just a picture-perfect fall day to be wandering around a gorgeous college campus. And I've always wanted to see Touchdown Jesus. Y'all know about Touchdown Jesus? This is a religious uh, painting, mural. It's on the side of the library at Notre Dame. But you can see it from the end zone of the football stadium. And it looks like Jesus is singling Touchdown. And that's why I call it Touchdown Jesus. But it's an incredibly important piece of religious art. And there's a tablet there, um, like a reader rail, that you can read all the symbology and what it's all about. And then you go, Touchdown. Um, another of our uh, important donors here at the museum is the Keough family. Uh, they d donated that wonderful W.R. Lee painting that's in our permanent gallery largest or most important single piece of art ever donated to the museum outside of the founding collection. They also donated most of those uh, T.D. Kelsey sculptures that were in the T.D. Kelsey Julie Orient exhibition that we just had. Uh, this uh, building is named for the Keough family. This is Keough Hall at Notre Dame. Uh, they gave a ton of money to Notre Dame over the years. I think they actually have two buildings named. They have this dorm and then I think the Irish Studies building is named for their family as well. So kind of made an homage to uh, go find their building while we were on campus there. Uh, this is our friend Cowboy Bob Miller, and this is his stagecoach. The Tesla with the gull wing doors. I think those are so cool, aren't they? So he picked us up at the hotel, took us to have breakfast in the Tesla. And then we went uh, while we were there and checked out the uh, Milwaukee Museum of Art. I'm sorry, Minneapolis Museum of Art Sculpture Garden. And uh, I, don't ask me to explain this piece of public sculpture, but uh, it's fun. And then uh, whenever I see one of these, I always send a picture to Joyce with me out in front of the love sculpture. Uh, they're scattered all over the country. To let her know I'm thinking about her and I love her when I'm gone. Because that's what Charlie Pride said you're supposed to do, right? Um, speaking of love, uh, food of love is one of the uh, things that we uh, do on these trips. Uh, so when we organize these trips, Hadley gets on a website called tvfoodmaps.com. And she checks out all these places where like Guy Fieri and Adam Rickman and Man vs. Food, uh, where they've gone to eat. And she picks out three meals a day and a snack. And uh, 
we plot these on the map for where we're going, and then it's my job to kind of fill in with cultural things so that we're enriching the mind in between enriching the other parts of the body. Um, this one was in Fargo, North Dakota, and you've heard of a, a flight, a testing flight, like a flight of beer or a flight of wine or whiskey or whatever. This was a bacon flight. So this is four different kinds of bacon. You can see the labels there. And we paired that up with some poutine, which uh, those of you who don't know, that's a Canadian delicacy primarily, which is French fries with gravy and cheese. So it's a very North Dakota thing to do. Um, and then in South Dakota, the state dish is called chislic. See, it says urban chislic behind her there. Chislic is little pieces of, of meat that are fried generally or sauteed and then served with french fries and dipping sauces. So you can see there's all kinds of little nuggets. There's pork nuggets, chicken nuggets, beef nuggets, and you dip them into various sauces and that's called chislic. Who knew, right? We sure didn't. Um, on the way through Omaha, though, one of the things we knew we wanted to see was this incredible land uh, rush monument um, that is the uh, spirit of the Nebraska pioneer. And so there's a bank in downtown Omaha, the first bank of uh, Nebraska, and they commissioned this piece of work, which is four city blocks long, and it has two covered wagons with all the animals, all the people, all the outriders, all the stuff, and they're going down through two city blocks of this park near where the bank is, and you can see the scale of this thing, it's life in a quarter, and then the wagon train is scaring up a herd of buffalo, and a herd of buffalo take up another block, and there's all these buffalo running through downtown Omaha that have been scared by the wagon train, and some of them have been scared right through the buildings. Because if you can imagine, these buffalo would have been scared up in like 1850 or something, 1840, and so the buildings were built around the spirit of the buffalo. That's kind of what it's meant to imply. And so these things are running down the middle of the streets and the planters, and then they're scaring up somebody else. Who would they be scaring? Not the Indians, the Canadian geese. So there's this huge, huge fountain towards the end of this thing, and uh, we were there in the winter, and so the water's turned off, but if you can imagine, there are water jets that shoot up out of this thing and hit the bottom of all these birds, and it looks like they're taken off out of this fountain, and, there, and all this water's coming off the bottom of them, dripping down and so on. I mean, it's incredibly dramatic in the summertime. Still pretty cool in the winter. And again, they're flying through downtown, and they're bashing into these buildings too. This whole thing's made out of bronze. It was done by three artists. Uh, two of the artists did the wagon train part, and that's Blair Buswell and Ed Proton. And then Kent Ulberg, who's a good friend of ours here at the museum, he did the wildlife part, so he did all the buffalo and all the birds. So at the end of this whole darn thing is the bank. And they have this huge atrium, and the birds are crashing into the atrium. And so on the outside, there's these bronze birds that are stuck to the building. There's a few birds that are halfway in the building. The outer half is bronze. All the birds on the inside are now in the modern day, and they're out of stainless steel. And some of them are both. So they're half, half bronze, half stainless, with a glass in the middle. And then the ones inside are stainless steel. So this thing covers four city blocks. If you ever get anywhere within hailing distance of Omaha, got to go check this out. It is so cool. Um, and I must also say that uh, a similar project, the Oklahoma Land Rush Monument, done by Paul Moore in Oklahoma City, is equally impressive and not more so. It's a half scale larger. It's life and a half. And you have to go looking for it because it's on the backside of the parking lot at the state capitol. But it's an incredible project, too. And it's the only two like it that I know of in the country. Absolutely amazing. And then we uh, got to Lauren Ence's house into his new studio. And uh, as I say, uh, uh, just rest in peace, my brother. Uh, speaking of Kent Ulberg, this was when I went to the Briscoe Art Museum show. That's in uh, San Antonio in March. And uh, they're one of the museums that's figured it out. You know, we always talk about we'd like to see a few more young people here and 
new people getting interested in collecting and know that this is going to continue, uh, they put on the best party in Western art. And they've got some of those second generation oil money people that have gotten excited about coming to a party at the museum and more importantly spending some money on art. And so this, the artists all look happy because they know these are people that are going to continue the collecting legacy. And uh, whenever I get a chance to hang out with Kent and his life, Verily, I love to do that. And uh, so we're hanging out that evening and uh, having a nice talk. And then all of a sudden, one of Kent's sculptures decided to attack me. <laughs> Kent said, don't move, don't move, don't move. Took a picture and said, OK, it can move. But then there was this guy, I felt somebody staring at me from the back. You know how you get that feeling when somebody you think staring at you? Really kind of that uneasy feeling. And so I kind of slowly turned around. And sure enough, this guy was staring at me. Does he look familiar? Looks like Gus from Lonesome Dove, doesn't it? That's a sculpture by Bill Nebaker that's in their sculpture garden there at the uh, Briscoe. And they have a really cool sculpture garden because they've got lots of pieces around the grounds of the museum. And then there's a sculpture trail that goes from the museum to the Alamo. And they've got some of the best contemporary sculptors to do various figures that are involved with the Alamo story. And so they have this whole uh, little walk there that you can walk and read about the people involved with the Alamo. Uh, and then occasionally we do a little fun side trip. Anybody ever been here? This is uh, called, well, it should be called Grun, which is green in German. But everybody in Texas calls it green because they don't want to say Grun. So this is Grun Green Hall. And it's probably the most famous dance hall in the state of Texas, in New Braunfels, or just north of there. And um, so a new friend of mine uh, is Richard King IV, as in King Ranch. And uh, he and I have gotten to be pretty friendly here in the last year or two. And uh, he's talking about having been in the music business and been in the oil business and gas business and various things. And uh, you know, I never doubted for a second that everything he ever told me was true. But you know some of those Texans, we love them. Um, so I decided to test them a little bit. And I called him and I said, uh, who do you know that can get us tickets to the sold out Lyle Lovett show Sunday night at Green Hall? And he said, let me check. 30 minutes later, he said, we've got two tickets in the VIP section. I don't doubt anything he says ever again after that. But uh, that was a pretty good show. Um, moving along to something a little closer to home, this was in April. Um, if, if you've not seen it, I think it closes maybe this weekend. Does anybody know for sure? Somebody check that if you would. Uh, the uh, Kevin Box Origami in the Garden show down at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. Uh, Kevin Box, of course, did the red horse that's upstairs in our sculpture court. And uh, from the time he came here to unveil that 12 years ago, he's been working on the Atlanta Botanical Garden about doing a show for his work. And he's had shows at several other botanical gardens around the country. And they kept telling him, you got to go big, you got to go big, you got to go lots of pieces, lots of big pieces. And he finally convinced them that he could do enough big pieces to fill that garden. And we got to go down the weekend, actually before it opened, and tour around the uh, installation with him. And that was pretty damn cool. Uh, most of these are kinetic. They move when the wind blows. They, they spin, or that big piece spins. And a lot of the individual ones do as well. Uh, the amount of time, money, and effort he's got in this project, I can only imagine. And so here we were on the side of the reflecting pond there with uh, he and his wife, Jennifer, talking to us about the installation, the project, and how it came together. And uh, just a brilliant guy, still young, in his 40s, and has accomplished so much already. You just can't imagine what he's going to do in his career. And as the technology continues to improve with computers and modeling and the ability to shape metals and do colors and just the sky's the limit, I think, for what he's going to do in his career. And working with some of the best origami artists in the world to inspire his designs. And his wife, Jennifer, who's equally part of the team and a, an important artist in her own right, uh, she started casting dresses 
in the same metal, and they're absolutely exquisite. Okay, I mentioned uh, Red Stegall, and there's a group I travel with every year uh, with those guys. It's been my honor to be part of that group, and uh, this year we went to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, this is one of the uh, abandoned churches there uh, down in what they call the Ace Basin, which is about an hour southwest of Charleston. We spent a whole day down there on some private plantations. Um, we went out to Fort Sumter, and uh, here's the guys helping raise the flag at Fort Sumter. Uh, if you've never done that, it's a pretty cool experience. If you get on the first boat of the day out of Charleston Harbor, you go out to Fort Sumter, the flag is not flying. You say, well, that kind of looks a little weird. Well, when you get out there, they have to get everybody all the way around this flag because it's like 100 feet or something. It takes everybody on the boat to hold it up to raise the flag. And uh, again, a very neat experience. Uh, we went to go see the Hunley. That's the uh, Civil War submarine. And uh, speaking of King Ranch, this is uh, T.O. Kleberg, who was the last family member to run the King Ranch and uh, former president of the American Quarter Horse Association and so on, a very important person in the Western world. This is him taking a, a turn at Crank and the Hunley. Uh, I can't imagine how scary that was. Uh, then we went to the uh, Enterprise aircraft carrier that's uh, docked there in Charleston Harbor permanently. And they have one of every plane that ever flew off the deck of that aircraft carrier on the, uh, on the flight line there. And so Top Gun had just come out. Here's me doing the rooster with the F-14. And then uh, this is one of the guys he travels with. This is Trent Willman, who's an important producer in uh, Nashville. Uh, he had a couple of minor hits as a singer, uh, but has really hit his, hit his lick as a producer. Uh, any of y'all know Cody Johnson, one of the current country guys? Uh, he just had his first number one hit with uh, Tell You Can't. And uh, it, was, it was Trent's first number one as a producer. And it happened about two, three weeks before we went on this trip. So he was still high from that experience. And it was great for us to be there and help him celebrate that experience in his lifetime. And so he serenaded us with a few songs on the last night of the trip. Uh, you can see we're on this beautiful... Um, marsh area there and uh, he's doing a couple of songs as the sun went down pretty special experience um leslie and i went to the uh, Preta west and on our way to the Preta west i always try to go through uh, bentonville arkansas go to crystal bridges and go through bartlesville and go to wool rock museum and gilcrease and philbrook of course the gilcrease is now closed for the next three or four years but uh, still worth making this loop and uh, this is us at wool rock and uh, one of their great sculptures on the grounds there. And then one of my favorite paintings in the whole world uh, called Looking Back by W.R. Lee. And we don't have time to go into it, but see me later. I'll give you the symbology on that. And then actually to the Preta West, which I call the Super Bowl of Western art. It's 100 of the best artists competing for the top prize. And this year it was won by Kyle Polzin. And I don't know how well you can see it, but this is the, the very top of a stagecoach, just like the one we have upstairs, which he built in his studio, a recreation of, and then got all this stuff to put on there and then painted it and won the Preta West. And he's a very deserving artist, very nice young man. We've had him here at the museum. But I really thought the one that should have won was this painting by Thomas Blackshear, uh, who we have in the permanent collection here and who we helped get started in Western art. And there's a better picture of it. It was an absolutely stunning painting. Uh, the staff there was all in favor of it being the winner, but you know, some days it doesn't go your way. But um, both deserving young artists for sure. Um, then we flew into Indi Indianapolis. Um, the little arrow there points to the Idle George Museum, kind of one of our sister museums in the Museums West group. Uh, they're like uh, 15, 20 years older than us but one of the few Western art museums in the East, and they are still in the East. I always feel like I should be on Central Time when I'm there, but it is in the Eastern time zone. And um, they had our Warhol exhibition um, that we put together here at the museum. And uh, so they asked us to come up and be there for the closing weekend. And this was Joyce doing a little uh, research for her, her job out there at Savoy, checking out what the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum was up to. And then uh, they had me do a gallery walk and a lecture and just uh, hang out with their upper level members for a couple of days. Uh, so this is in their gallery. 
Uh, this is one of our uh, circle members uh, that actually belongs to the Idol Jorgan here, Ryan Furman, and uh, also Tom Gibbs. Tom and Patty Gibbs are circle members here at the booth and also involved in the uh, Idol Jorg Museum. So we love our friends up at the Idol Jorg that are involved in both museums. And then uh, I had to go to the Mayo Clinic for a little while. Those of you who don't know, I had brain surgery um, early in August, and they put a little uh, brain pacemaker in, and uh, that was fun. And then this is us leaving the hospital, and I said, hey, let's swing by Sawgrass and play, play golf. You know, that's where they have that island green out in the middle of the 17th hole, but uh, they wouldn't let me out there. Uh, you can see I have a little, little scar there, which has healed up pretty good, I think. But um, thanks to all of you who uh, sent your prayers and best wishes, and you know, it really meant a lot to us. And um, we heard from a lot of folks during that period of time, and uh, really reinforced to us what a family we do have here at the Booth Museum. So thank you to everybody who was involved in that. Okay, enough about that, except to say that my friend uh, um, Aaron, who used to work at the Crystal Bridges Museum, and we call him Kilt Boy, because the one time he came to Cartersville, we went to go to a concert at the Grand Theater, and he showed up with a kilt on. Now, he's got the legs for it, I know, but um, you know, ever since he's been known as Kilt Boy, but he did this little cartoon of me now being part of the Borg, since I have this stuff in me and worried that the museum community was not going to be able to handle me if I got turned up any further than I already was. So that's kind of what this was all about. And then uh, this is just uh, three weeks ago. Uh, Joyce and I went out to Jackson Hole for a few days during their arts week out there. And uh, it was pretty smoky most of the time we were there, so we never got a truly clear shot of the, uh, of the Tetons, really. But uh, a new friend of the museum invited us to stay at their house, and this is the view from their deck. So you can guess where that is. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but that's looking at the other side of the house, down the Snake River. That's not a million dollar view. Um, now that might be a million dollar view, the million dollar cowboy bar there in town. Um, and then our friend Palma Rhodes, who runs the uh, Art Guild, uh, they have a house out there, and they put us up one night as well, which we appreciated. Um, and she took us out to see some wildlife. And this is a pencil drawing that I did of what we saw. Anybody believe that? There's a Photoshop filter that makes it look like a pencil drawing. Right, Lawson? Um, but what we were really there to do was uh, Amy Ringholtz, the artist there in Jackson Hole, and I have been talking about doing a dinner, uh, inviting some of her fans and some of our fans together that might be out in Jackson Hole that week to have a, uh, a nice dinner at her gallery. And uh, she and her staff just did an incredible job setting up this beautiful table and making it look uh, so nice. We had, uh, I think we had 23, 24 folks who bought tickets for this. Uh, it was a $150 ticket. And the... Uh, extra funds went to our Haas fund, and then Amy has a uh, scholarship fund to uh, buy art supplies for emerging artists. And we made about a thousand bucks for each of those two charities that night. And um, this is what we served. Everybody always wanted to know, what did you have to eat? Well, we did drunken shrimp as kind of a pre-appetizer amuse. Uh, this is us plating up the carrot bisque. And if you look real close, you can see I did a little R with the sour cream for Ringholz Gallery there in the bowl. And then uh, Joyce's Harvest Salad that we like to do. Has lots of fruit and things in it. Uh, and then we did my dad's meatloaf, which is a gourmet meatloaf with a twice baked potato and some uh, roasted and sauteed vegetables there on the side. And in the piece de resistance, the Krispy Kreme bread pudding for dessert. They'd never had anything quite like that in Jackson Hole before. And uh, we lucked out so much, uh, Amy was in charge of finding us a kitchen helper. And it's just supposed to be somebody that was a, you know, a line cook or a catering person or somebody just to have a little extra help for putting this together. And at the last minute, she found this lady whose name was Giffy. And Giffy walked in the house where we were doing all this cooking. And I said, oh, where do you work? And she said, oh, I work at Snow King which is the big resort at the bottom of the mountain there in Jackson Hole. 
in, t in town. And I said, oh, what's your job? She said, I'm the executive chef. <laughs> and Joyce and I, both our mouths fell wide open. And uh, she said, well, where do you work? And I said, I work at the we Booth Western Art Museum. She said, and what's your job? I said, I'm the executive director. <laughs> she said, you're not a chef? Because she thought she was coming to help some chef put a dinner together. And thank God she came, because uh, she wound up doing a lot of it. I was not feeling that well that day. But uh, it was an awesome experience, and uh, raised some money for charity, and so it was a good day. Um, I was just in Cody, Wyoming last weekend. Anybody recognize uh, either of the folks in this picture, either of the guys? Byron Price in the center, um, probably the greatest living historian of Western art in America. Uh, he was a consultant on this museum for two years while we were building it. And then he was my thesis advisor, my graduate advisor, when I went back to graduate school. Uh, to the right is Al Simpson, Senator Al Simpson from Wyoming who was uh, in the Senate for like 40 years and uh, was also the chairman of the board of the Cody uh, Buffalo Bill Museum, Cody, Wyoming, for almost that long of time as well. One of the truly great gentlemen in the world and uh, from the generation where politicians compromised and got things done across the aisle. And uh, I won't say anything about that today, but we could use a few more Al Simpsons in the world. Um, so I went to their art show, and uh, Byron did a talk. And uh, my, the highlight of that weekend is always to get invited, if possible, out to a lady named Naomi Tate's house, because this is her house. Uh, she has a guest ranch out the South Fork in Cody. So this is looking one way uh, out of the house. That's looking down the front driveway. Uh, that's looking behind the house. Uh, that's looking the other way in front of the house. And it's pretty incredible. So, um, anyway, that's my travels. Uh, let's look at a little art that's new to the museum. Now, right off the bat, you're going to say, all right, I've seen this before. Well, it's been hanging in our galleries for many years, but it's new to the permanent collection. And many of you have heard me talk before about the Tia collection. Uh, Tia is the daughter of a gentleman from India who went to Taos, Santa Fe, New Mexico in like 2006, six seven fell in love with that area and started buying a lot of art. And the more art he bought, the more art he looked at, and the more different kinds of art he decided he liked, and the more different kinds of art he started buying. Such that now he's on his third or fourth warehouse in Santa Fe. And uh, they have an incredible, incredible world-class collection of art from all over the world. But the core of it is Western art. And we have been so lucky to have almost 50 pieces from that collection here in the museum. Uh, over the last 10 years or so. When we added on that new wing, we would have been scraping the bottom of the barrel to get enough art to, to hang in the museum uh, without this collection. And they've been incredible partners with us ever since. We've had a couple of temporary exhibitions that they've been involved with and so on. But when the uh, COVID pandemic hit, um, the gentleman said, I know museums are struggling. I'd like to help. I'd like to donate a few pieces that you've had on long-term loan. And that was the first time we'd ever had any inkling that that might even be possible. Because not being an American citizen, there's really not a lot of tax advantages or things for him. And uh, so it was really exciting when they let us know we were going to be able to acquire a few pieces, one of them being this Earl Biss. And Earl Biss was one of the first students at the IAIA, the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, which is an incredibly important uh, organization and really ought to get the most credit for developing contemporary Western art as a subcategory or as its own thing. Uh, also from the Tia collection comes this wonderful Ethelinda painting and this Logan Hajej painting. So all three of these have been here quite a while, but now we own them. And so how about a round of applause for the Tia collection? We also uh, were recently gifted this wonderful uh, Vic Payne piece, which adds to our collection of his work. We, we of course, have the great eagle catcher. We have the uh, canoe piece I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is when the hunter becomes the hunted, one of his key pieces. And uh, that was recently donated to the museum as well. Uh, this is a recent purchase. Uh, this was in the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction last year. 
Uh, David Nordahl is an artist that we have several pieces by. But uh, the collections committee looked at it and just thought that it's such a neat story. You know, here's the Indians on top. They're looking over here. Uh, these guys look like Mexican or Hispanic influence uh, going the other way. And uh, the guy decides to light up a cigarette. Probably not a good idea on many fronts, right? All heck's about to break loose. It's called unaware. And it's a pretty big painting. You can see the dimensions there. It's like five feet by two and a half, three feet. Um, this is the most important piece of sculpture, probably, that's ever been given to the museum. Uh, you could argue that for sure. But uh, this is uh, Buffalo by Henry Schrady. Henry Schrady also did the um, cavalry charge piece that's right inside the door to the Civil War gallery over there. If you haven't looked in there in a while, look at that on your way out. Incredible piece of American sculpture. Actually belongs to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We have it a long-term loan. But this buffalo is regarded to be the best buffalo ever sculpted in American art history by most of the scholars. And many of them would go a step further and say it's the greatest piece of wildlife that's ever been sculpted in American art history. And so a very important piece. Uh, it's public record that one of these sold. It's, it's not so public that one of our members bought it. But one of these sold a couple of years ago for $400,000. So just let you know the magnitude and the ballpark we're talking about um, with a piece of sculpture of this magnitude. Um, again, this is a piece that's been here for a while at the museum. Um, but with uh, the passing of, of Robert Hunter, Bob Hunter, who many of you knew, uh, the Hunter family, and Barbara in particular, um, dispersed a number of pieces to the museum um, at his passing, several of which had already been here on loan for a while, and uh, become the Hunter legacy collection here at the museum, including this great Kurt Walters, and this wonderful piece by Arturo Chavez, on view out in our uh, wildlife and landscape gallery. Uh, this was a recent purchase. Uh, this is a uh, very uh, contemporary artist, Randy Lee White. Uh, was a pretty big deal in the 70s and 80s. And uh, this is uh, called antelope hide. And it's a little problematic to display, so we're gonna have to figure out what to, what to do to get that on display at some point. But it's a really, really cool piece. And again, you can see the size on it. It's about four by four feet, so significant piece. Um, another exciting donation we had recently was uh, several dozen cowboy boots, uh, all of them intricately stitched and really decorated. Um, the gentleman and his wife, uh, the Sandronis, who donated it, have said, um, you know, why don't you keep the ones you really want for the permanent collection and the others, you know, find a place for or see if you can raise some money for the museum. And that's the kind of donation you want to hear about, um, where you get to pick the very best and keep it in the collection and then you know, maybe dispose of some of it to uh, help pay for taking care of the other part of it. You know, that's the ideal. And um, so you may see a few of these show up in various places over the next few years. Uh, but the ones that we've put on display up in the uh, objects gallery uh, upstairs in the uh, modern west wing are truly incredible. If you get a chance, run up there and check it out. Are there eight, ten pair up there now? There's 17 pair on view? Okay. Yeah, so 17 pair are actually out. I didn't realize there were that many. Shows you what I know. Um, this is another pretty uh, unique and interesting gift. Uh, this is from the Clappers who live down at Spring Island, South Carolina. Uh, they were involved with the Idle George that I mentioned earlier uh, for many years. But when they moved south, got interested in the Booth Museum. And uh, we have 60 of these owls, approximately. And those are all out on view as well. Half of them, a third of them, nothing. I thought I saw some up there. See, I don't know what the heck's going on. We'll be getting them on view. But uh, there are 60 of these owls, if you can imagine that. And these are ceramic pieces. It went better in rehearsal, didn't it? Um, we were out at William Matthews Studio in Denver on our member trip two years ago, and uh, this was the newest thing that he was working on, which was reprising some of his greatest paintings from his career and re-envisioning them as ties. 
And you say, well, that's cool, but what makes it art? Well, what makes it art is they're five feet tall. And so they're bigger than these panels. And um, we found one we really liked and said, you know, hey, how about us having that for the museum? We worked out a deal. And he said, well, how about two more for not too much more money? And we said, can't pass that up. It's basically three for the price of one. So uh, I had that uh, cowboy piece. This one's called Granary. You can see it's a grain elevator. And this is the first one that we saw that we really liked, which is one of his really classic uh, original paintings that he did when he first started doing cowboys. So uh, we've got to figure out how to hang those, too, which is a challenge. But uh, hoping to do that sometime soon. Um, and I've had uh, two or three other incredible donors uh, to the collection over the last couple of years that are starting to wind down their collecting and think about their legacy and their, their family's legacy and their, with their collection and having collected things for 30 or 40 years now and you know what to do with them. And uh, we're happy to help advise them. Uh, this is a wonderful Martin Greeley painting from the uh, collection of Joyce Stevens. Uh, Frank McCarthy painting from that same collection. Uh, their name, uh, John and Joyce Stevens, on the uh, Wildlife and Landscape Gallery. Uh, great supporters of the museums, great friends of the museum. Uh, and then I've got a couple of pieces from the collection of Shirley and Tuffy Holland. And they're from Greeley, Colorado. And they came here to the museum, and they fell in love with the booth. And they said, boy, I wish it was a 1,000 miles closer, because we, we'd sure be here a lot. And we would think about giving our collection to the museum. Well, as things transpired. We didn't move the museum any closer, but their heart got closer to the museum. And they really decided that this was where they thought the bulk of their collection really belongs, because we're collecting a lot of the same artists that they did and celebrating those artists and so on. And so this is a wonderful Charlie Dye called Slicker Spooked from that collection. Uh, this is from the Clapper collection, uh, the same ones that the uh, um, owls came from. And this is another incredible piece uh, to add to our kind of Western folk art, um, decorative arts collections. And again, it's a little, little problematic to display. So these are things that as we um, clear these challenges, you'll see appearing at some point somewhere. Uh, another piece from the Holland Collection by Bill Anton. Might be the best cowboy painter going. Um, certainly one of them. A uh, really beautiful piece of his work. Uh, you remember we had the Mike Polson waterfall exhibit here not too long ago. Uh, this is the one that we wound up purchasing for the permanent collection uh, from that exhibition. And again, a pretty good sized piece, about three by four feet there. These are the, the uh, unknown waterfalls in Yellowstone. Uh, back to the Hunter collection again. Uh, they were incredible collectors of everything. Painting, sculpture, musical instruments, books, dolls, beadwork, guns, knives. Um, mountain man stuff, you name it. But uh, this is one of the, the really great artists uh, in the uh, native art world doing dolls, Rhonda Holy Bear. And uh, they had several pieces of hers that were ribbon winners at Indian Market. And uh, this is an example of her work, just a really fine piece. And uh, interestingly enough, we had uh, this painting donated not too long ago by the wife of the artist who's passed, that's Ray Swanson. Uh, his wife, Bev, called me one day and said, would you like to have this painting? And I thought it really went well with the doll that we had just gotten. It's called her favorite doll. So maybe we can pair those up at some point. Uh, also got this uh, wonderful uh, collection of bags that came from the hunters as well. I told you they collect everything. Um, this is just another example. Uh, this was a recent purchase, a Dan Dominga painting. Uh, Naminga is like Earl Biss, I mentioned before, one of those artists who was in the early first classes at IAIA IA out of Santa Fe, and really love his work, have a couple of pieces on display regularly, and at some point we'll rotate this one in. Uh, Barbara Martin, a uh, great friend and supporter of the museum, uh, gave this wonderful Joseph Henry Sharp not too long ago when she uh, was downsizing and moving to Florida. And then a couple of purchases here. These are pieces by Carl Bodmer, and they are, uh, they are prints. And why would the museum be buying a print? Well, it's really the only way you can get Bodmer's work. 
there are very, very, very few originals, and most of those belong at the Jocelyn Museum in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And so this is the way that most people would have seen this work, was prints that were done in the day and then distributed because people wouldn't have had a chance to see the original work. Most of that original work, by the way, was owned by an energy company that happened to go bankrupt. Anybody remember Enron? Enron had bought a gas company that owned most of this work. And one of the things that the, the powers that be did on the way out the door before it went bankrupt was give all that art to the Jocelyn Museum in Nebraska, thank goodness, because who knows where it would have ended up. But uh, Catlin and Bodmer really go hand in hand. That's who John Coleman based his series of sculptures out here on were the drawings and paintings of uh, George Catlin and Carl Bodmer. And of course, we have the wonderful Catlins from the Smithsonian collection. But this would be an opportunity to at least be able to see something of Bodmer's art um, relative to Catlin. Excuse me. OK. Yep, one more, which is the other Bodmer that came with the one we bought. OK, who's got questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, they closed um, pre to West weekend last year, so they've been closed a year and a half. Probably going to be closed another two and a half to three. They are blowing up the entire campus and starting over, and uh, going to completely rethink it. And if you can imagine, they're actually putting back less gallery space than they had before. Now, why you would do that, I have no idea. That's what they're doing. We've talked about that. Um, the building wasn't necessarily configured exactly to do that. Um, we try to put a lot of objects in those cases that we do have. Uh, it's not open storage by any means, but we certainly try to put it, have it be uh, what we would say artifact intensive, where there's a lot of things on view. But uh, you know, we've, we've got most of the good stuff on view most of the time, and we try to rotate it pretty well. You know, we're not in a position where 10% of our stuff is out or anything like that. So you know, that would be probably further in the future that we would think about something like that. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is, um, you're talking about this picture in particular. This was on the way to the West. And um, in Bodmer's body of work, when he comes to America, almost half of it is before they get to the West. Because he's so excited to be on this trip, he's sketching all this stuff and everything they see, like in Pennsylvania and Indiana and all these places, before they actually get to the West. And so a lot of, a lot of what you see is this little bit more Eastern or, or certainly not Western looking material. And when he gets out west, he starts getting more selective and you know, doing fewer pieces, but, but putting more time into each one. So it's kind of interesting that you know, his body of work is very uh, divided between the east and the west. That's my take on why it's that way. Anybody else? OK, we'll see you uh, at the symposium and the festival in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll see you back here uh, five weeks from today. November 9th for uh, Art for Lunch with the Ekmans. Thank you for coming out today.